Okay, so now we've talked about DNA replication and the nature of DNA. Let's talk now about how DNA is used by organisms, and that is how the um, genes uh, that reside on our in our chromosomes on the DNA, how it's used to make RNA and then protein, that is to do transcription and then translation. Now here's a, we've covered many experiments, here's one called the Beetle-Tatum Beetle experiment, and this is one in which they demonstrated that uh, centrally particular genes are responsible for particular proteins or particular enzyme. This became known as the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. In their experiment, they're looking uh, at um, this uh, organism, here it is, Neurospora, a type of uh, protist that has this biochemical pathway in which a, this starting molecule is converted into ornithine and then citrulline and arginine, and there are a series of enzymes that do this. And so in their experiment, they have um, just wild type or normal forms of this organism that grow on what we call minimal medium, this, which is an agarose-based medium. It has the minimal amount of nutrients and food that they need uh, to, to do just fine. And then they have these different mutants. And under just with just minimal medium, none of the mutants grow. Okay, so there's something, something wrong with them. They're mutants. But now we see that um, these class one mutants, if they're provided with minimal medium and then this extra compound ornithine, they do just fine. But then the class two and three mutants do not. If citrulline is provided, the class one and class two do just fine, but the class three doesn't. And then if they're all given, or if they're given arginine, they all do just fine. Now, notice in our pathway, arginine is the product that is being made. So essentially, if you provide them with this, they do just fine. So what they were able to demonstrate is that these mutants have a particular mutation of a particular gene which affects their ability to make enzymes that, in case of the class 1 mutants, keeps them from making the starting molecule or converting it into ornithine. The class 2 are missing the enzyme that allows them to convert ornithine into citrulline. Because notice the class 2 mutants, if you give them citrulline, they do fine. But if you give them ornithine, they don't do so well because, again, they're not able to convert it into the next step. And with class 3 mutants, if you provide them with citrulline, the other ones do all right, but they don't because, again, they can't, well, they can't convert it into the arginine. And so essentially, these different mutant strains have um, defective particular genes that are responsible for making the enzymes that allow them to carry out this biochemical pathway. Now, as we'll be talking about um, in this, this chapter and others, is that while this idea does apply in certain situations, that is, you have particular genes that are responsible for a particular enzyme, as we'll see, not all genes are necessarily responsible for coding for enzymes. Many of them code for non-enzymatic proteins, and we'll see some of them code for RNAs that are never converted or used to make proteins, at least not directly. What they're sort of getting at with their idea is that, or what they're demonstrating is that you have particular uh, mitochondrial RNAs that are made that then are used to make proteins, but not all genes are used to make mRNAs. Okay. Now, transcription and translation. So the use of DNA to make RNA and then the use of RNA to make proteins. Don't make the mistake of saying something or thinking to the effect that DNA is converted in RNA or RNA is converted into proteins, that, that freshman mistake, because they're not converted. It's that DNA, we would say, is used as a template to make RNA, and then RNA is used as a 
template to make proteins. There's no converting these from one to the other. Now bacteria, they're doing this, they don't have a nucleus, they just do this all inside the whole cell basically. The DNA is used as a template to make some RNAs, and then that mRNA is used as a template to make proteins, and the ribosomes, it's all happening there. Whereas there's a little uh, compartmentalization of things in the, in the uh, eukaryote in that, of course, the DNA is inside the nucleus, and so the RNAs are made inside the nucleus. That is, transcription occurs there. The RNAs are transported out of the nucleus um, to get together with the ribosomes, and so translation happens outside in the cytoplasm with the assistance of the ribosomes, and as you recall, this often takes place on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now notice there's an extra step that eukaryotes have, this RNA processing. Um, the genome of eukaryotes is much more complicated than in bacteria, and that is um, in eukaryotes, in our genes, there's a lot of extra pieces of DNA, as we'll see, that are going to, through the process of transcription and translation, are going to be processed out. Um, and those don't really exist in bacterial cells. Um, so there's this RNA processing that occurs in eukaryotes. So we'll spend some time on that. All right, but now let's talk about the genetic code, because this is essentially the code that tells us how DNA is going to be used to make RNA and then how the RNA will be interpreted to make a protein. So one of our, of course, DNA is double-stranded and one of those strands is used as the template that determines the sequence of bases in an RNA transcript. So of course here's an A, so there would be a U down in an RNA because remember RNA does not have thymine, it has uracil instead. Here's a C, so now we have a G down here, C, G, A, U, A, U, and where we have a T, we have an A. So the RNA template, the RNA strand is complementary to the template strand, but instead of T's, we have U's. All right, so then in the next step, translation, we're going to use the genetic code here to translate our RNA, our mRNA, into a sequence of amino acids. And so we cluster clumps of three bases on our mRNA into these things called, called codons. And each codon is responsible, or most codons are responsible for a particular amino acid. And so, for example, we see UGG. And notice in a codon, there's sort of the first, second, and then third base. And so when we look at our genetic code, we see, so what is it again, UGG. So here's our first right here, U, our second, U, and our third, G. So UUG, so that codes for leucine. Sure, oh, wait, wait a second. I'm sorry, I was looking at UUG, it's UGG. So U, G, G is tryptophan. All right, now I got myself together. So there we go, tryptophan. Then U, 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 U. There we go, is phenylalanine. And then G, G, C. So now we're down here. G, G, C is glycine. And U, C, A is going to be serine. So essentially look at the first, second, and third bases in the codon and you use the genetic code and you can figure out which amino acid goes in which spot. Now, um, there's a couple ones to pay attention to here in particular. And I notice th that this one, UAG, is always the start codon. It also codes for an amino acid called methionine. And then there are these three that are the stop codons. And when that is reached on the mRNA translation stops. You stop adding amino acids. Also notice that um, there's repetition in our genetic code. Uh, when you take um, four, 
four uh, nucleotides, that is in DNA we have a language of four, and you put them in combinations of three, you get essentially 64 different amino acids, and so that's what are four bases in a combination of three. And so, but there's only, of course, 20 amino acids. So there's a lot of repetition in the code. For example, you can see there's six different codons that code for, for leucine. There are these four that code for proline. Um, arginine has these four and then these two. Serine looks like it just has two. So you can see some have two, some have four, some have six. Methionine, as far as I can tell, is, is no, is the only one that has one codon. And then, of course, we have our three stop codons. So you'll notice that, for example, let's look at leucine. What really matters are the first two. If it's a CU, it will be leucine. The third one doesn't matter. It's some what's sometimes called the wobble in the third base. It can vary a little bit. Um, and the same with proline. As long as it's CC, it doesn't matter what the fourth one. Threonine and AC, it doesn't matter what the fourth one is. Some of them it does, like serine and arginine. They both begin with AG, but it depends on whether it's UC or AG in the third, third base of the codon. All right. And so this code is essentially universal. The vast majority of organisms use the code in the same way, such that, uh, and this basically makes genetic engineering possible. So you can move DNA between different types of organisms, even between plants and animals, between fungi, bacteria and animals, anywhere, and they will all interpret the code in the same way because of its universality. All right, so there's section one. We'll stop that video and move on to transcription in the next video.